Hey everyone, this is Josh back with Cardboard Chronicles and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I have Josh Luber, the co-founder of StockX. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Doing great. Uh, appreciate you joining me. I know you're a busy guy and uh, you guys have a lot going on with sports cards lately. Uh, you guys just added sports cards collectibles to your platform on StockX, which is exciting. Uh, there's a lot of buzz in the hobby about it, so I thought it would be awesome to get you on and hear directly from you. Yeah, no, look, thanks thanks for having me on. Um, honestly, like every opportunity we have to talk about what we're doing is just, one, it's exciting, but also sort of just like humbling from the fact that like I've collected cards, you know, when I was, I don't know, like eight and to now be at like at this part of actually like, you know, working within the hobby and, and starting to try to do something I think can be pretty, you know, interesting and exciting for it. it it's uh, It's like, it's still a little bit uh, kind of weird actually. Yeah. So what do you think of the hobby so far? Maybe some of like the people you've met and, and what you've seen so far. What do you think? Yeah. Well, like I, you know, I, particularly when I talk to reporters or people outside of the hobby and they ask me about sort of my, um, you know, sort of my background, my relation to it, you know, I have, like, I, I say the same thing, which is like, I have the most prototypical story ever, right? Like I'm 41 years old. I collected cards from like, you know, 86 to 92, like right in the heart of the junk wax era. I have like all that crap. It's all been sitting at my mom's basement for 30 years, right? And had had basically left the hobby as, uh, as a lot of people did and, you know, have the benefit of getting back into it in the last like year and a half and, um, and now like turbocharged. And what's great is... Well, first of all, I, without having to, to tell everyone what they know about what's going on in the hobby in terms of the growth and the excitement around it. But, you know, there's a really interesting, because you asked about the people, there's a really interesting uh, mix of people that have been there the whole time and people that have come back at different stages along. And then the people that are sort of like net new to it. And like, I, I just think it's a really like interesting dynamic of people as you like you're, and by the way, some of them from a technology standpoint, because we're a tech company, right, are at the far end. Of, of using technology in their business or the far other end, right? Which is also really interesting to see in different ways in that. So anyway, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty important for my audience and collectors in general to kind of like humanize you guys a little bit. Uh, just being new to the hobby and, and knowing that you guys actually do have a background in the hobby and this isn't just, you know, some new thing you're adding to your business, but you actually are passionate about cards itself. What, what do you have to say about, about that specifically? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I collected cards before I collected sneakers. Um, and you know, it was, uh, you know, part of this is a, a true story of, of basically how StockX got into cards. You know, we, we started in sneakers and, and we've, we've, uh, been very successful in sneakers and we've added other categories, streetwear and watches and handbags and collectible toys. And so we've always been monitoring all other potential new categories and cards have, have always been on that list. Um, but the thing that pushed it over was last Thanksgiving. Uh, so about almost exactly a year ago, last Thanksgiving, um, I drove home to my parents' house in Philadelphia. So I grew up in Philadelphia. I now live in Detroit and, uh, and I have two kids or seven and four. And honestly, like I just didn't want to deal with, with Thanksgiving airport. And, and I was like, let's just drive home. And it's a nine and a half hour drive, but we put the kids in the minivan and put some movies on and like, great, we made it a road trip. So I drove home and, and my mother was like, oh, you drove home. You're taking all your baseball cards out of my house. And I was like, uh, okay. And I, I thought about it. I'm like, I left home. I graduated college. And I guess I'd never really driven home. And so, okay. And so I took all my cards out of my mother's basement. And I spent the next like two weeks in Detroit in my basement, like just nonstop every day after work, like going through everything and just got like amped back up about all of it. And then that was really the impetus to like, all right, let's take a really deep dive into what's going on in the hobby today. Does this make sense for StockX, et cetera? And what, what I came out of it, and I, I believe this now more than ever, is that cards may actually be the perfect product to be on StockX, even better than sneakers and streetwear and these other categories, because all these other categories, sneakers, sneakers is a, is a commercial product. It's a consumer good that we turned into a tradable asset to be on StockX. But cards have always been tradable assets, right? So it is like, it, it, and so anyway, so all that, it's like it, it started as literally cleaning out my, my cards in my mother's basement. And, um, and now I get to do it here. And what was also really interesting uh, dynamic here was around the same time, actually in between the time Thanksgiving and now, we, um, we actually hired a new CEO. I actually replaced myself as CEO of StockX. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and they're all really great. Um, but one of the things was like, what am I going to focus my time on? And I was like, this is great. I was like, 
I, I'm going to run cards. And so I still do a lot of all the other stuff I do, but like, I was like, now I get to be the one to run cards the same way it was like running sneakers on day one and like, and own that part of the business. So yeah, so this is super like personal and, and for me as well. Um, but it also fits stock like perfectly. Yeah, why don't you tell us about the King Griffey desk? I've seen, I've seen pictures of it. What's up with the desk? So unfortunately I have this like computer set up here. I can't move the computer around to show you the desk. Uh, we can uh, send you pictures. I, I'll, I'll grab some else in a second to show you. So, um, we never had offices and, uh, and then we decided to build offices and I was like, Oh sweet. So, and I, I had always had this idea of having a desk that was made out of all Griffey 89 upper decks. So I basically gave the design plans. I, I, I concepted, I was like, I want the front of the desk to have sneaker shells with, with lighting. Cause in my, my closet at home, my, my sneaker room at home has these really great shelves for sneakers with lighting on it. So I was like, I want to have two rows of sneakers with lighting. And I want the whole top to be all 89 upper deck Griffies. And that was all the idea I had. And they came back to me with a, with a, a mock-up of it and they built this desk and it holds 280 cards. I was like, okay. I was like, I got a lot of Griffies to buy. So, you know, I had, I don't know, like five, eight from like when I was a kid. So I, um, I started buying up Griffies, but as you know, it doesn't matter what condition a Griffey ate on a wreck in, like there's just a floor. Like you can't buy one for less than 25 bucks. And you know, I'm literally go walking around shows asking like, do you have any upper deck Griffey's like preferably like really bad condition? Right. Because so I got to uh, about a hundred, 110 and the desk was ready. So what we did was we filled in the rest of the desk with all other Griffey rookies. So in the middle, there's a hundred upper deck on the right. There's like 40, uh, 89 Fleer, 40, 89 score update and a 40, 89 Donruss and 40, uh, 89 tops traded. But this whole time I've been buying more Griffey's. And so I have a box here, which I'm glad this is like easily accessible where I have, you know, I mean, I have, probably another hundred in here. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's just non, uh, you know, it's, it's the best. Um, and so when I get to 280, we're going to reopen the desk, uh, and put them all back in and fill it. And literally the company that made the desk, like that was part of the contract. I was like, you're going to come back here and open this thing up because it's sealed. So that way, like, if you spill like a drink or something on the desk, it won't, um, it won't, uh, like, you know, ruin the cards. But, um, but yeah, so in, um, uh, I, I think I'm up to, I think I'm up to right around like 220, so I have about 60 more, um, and um, then uh, and then we'll, we'll open it back up. But you know, even at even at 25 hours a piece, like 280 times 25 starts to get pretty expensive. So uh, fortunately, uh, some people have been sending me donations. Friends of mine who knows I've been collecting them, have been pulling them out of their parents' basement and sending it to me. So uh, we're getting it. But like you know, like I said, for me you know, and for everyone that era, like that was it, right? That was the seminal card. And it just has such a, um, a strong, like just memory of that part of my life that I was like, it's gotta be that card and the whole thing. And so it's worked out pretty well. So I was going to say, I guess there's a pretty decent chance that you like that card. <laughs> yeah. Some strong attachments. What have you, what have you dug into so far? I know you guys have obviously done your homework on some of the more modern stuff as it relates to the, to stock X, but what have you personally started digging into in the card world? I, I know you were at national. Is there any like cards that stand out to you or like, what do you think about the modern landscape? Yeah. So what's interesting is, um, you know, up until the national, I had only bought, um, basically nostalgic cards in terms of like re entering myself as a personal collector. You know, I bought just a lot of, so for some reason back when I was a kid, you know, I bought all the stuff that everyone buys in that thing, right? I have a whole bunch of, you know, 87 top sets and stuff like that. But for some reason, I was uh, a fan of Willie Mays. And so my card collection is all exactly what you'd think it would be. And then all these Willie Mays, including a 52 tops. So, um, so basically a lot of my, my purchasing in the last year had been just sort of filling in my Mays collection and then like, you know, buying like old box of 89 Donruss just for the fun of it. And then at the national, I started to just like, all right, I want to, you know, figure out what my thesis is going to be here. And so I'm from Philly. And so I started buying Simmons and Embiid and Wentz. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, all summer I was like, man, just looking at the market. And by the end of, by uh, probably about the third week of the NFL season, when Mahomes was just going absolutely nuts and watching his cards go like that, I basically, my, I, I said, I'm going to make a big bet here. And I was like, I think Luke is massively undervalued. Like, what would you do in 2004 if you knew LeBron right now? If you knew what LeBron was going to be? 
You would buy every car you possibly could in 2004. And so for the last like eight weeks, I had just bought every Luke I can possibly buy to, yeah, well, my wife hopefully won't see this, but like, like just, I just think he's mad. And, and we've seen a little bit of spike just in the first two weeks of the season. Right. Or the first week. And he's just massively undervalued. Like this is a, a first team all NBA player this year. Like at, at worst second team all NBA. He, he's, his cards are massively undervalued. So that has been my like big bet, but also just sort of looking around just generally in terms of like, you know, a lot of this just, the way the mo- the market moves so quickly, like seeing what Gary Vee did with the with the LeBron and with De'Aaron Fox, and you know when you have people that they go out there, like um, it's really clear how quickly the the market moves. So anyway, I still think he's massively undervalued, but my guess is by by mid season, uh, the prices are going to catch up on on all of Lucas. So. Well, my friend Chris will be very happy to hear this. I know he's watching. Uh, he's a huge Luca guy, and him and I are always going back and forth about is Luca the next LeBron? You know, back and forth about that. I mean, just like and and having Porzingis there right now, who like just looks awesome, right next to him and and all that. Yeah, like it's just Luca's special and yeah, like how do you go into uh, the the season with you know his rookies being less than like everyone? Like they they started. I mean, obviously they've creeped up a little bit, but you could buy a, a ten you know base for like seventy bucks at the start of the season. Yeah. Um, can you speak to like just how much fun you're having buying those cards? I know like a lot of people are, bu- are buying Luca and Trey Young because it's it's fun to collect these guys while they're in their you know playing so well and kind of the hype is all there. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it's a really good point because I find that it it is absolutely less exciting to buy. Uh, you know, I, I still have a couple maze I have to fill in. I think I have almost every um, like base maze, and it just it doesn't have the same level of excitement, right? Um, you know, I had. Um, uh, I had actually been a, a pretty big fan of Altuve from my fantasy baseball days. I had like had him on my team for a bunch of years and, and carried my, you know, carried myself to a, a fantasy championship a couple of years ago. So I'd bought a bunch of Altuve rookies and then just to like watch the little spike during the world series, right? Like that stuff is like just so much fun to watch like the overreaction, the market, but, and this is like, it is not meant to be a, a biased uh, stock X plug, but the one thing that has been most um, useful in the other markets, particularly sneakers, is to be able to give a real-time view of market pricing. And you know, today I'm going there and I'm literally like you know searching eBay every day and looking at sold auctions every day to see you know what the new prices of Trey Youngs are at and what the new prices of Luke is at, what the new price of Ben Simmons is at, which is just like antiquated, right? And by the way, this is exactly how the, the sneaker market worked in 2015 before we launched. And today in the sneaker market, everyone just goes to StockX and looks for what the, the price of a, of a Jordan 1, you know, bread is. And so, like, I am just, like, chomping at the bit for us to build up enough traction and enough, you know, um, uh, just uh, liquidity within StockX so that I can just go look at StockX and see what the Lucas are worth and, as opposed to having to, to go back and forth. And, um, and, that, and that really is, like, there's a million things we could talk about StockX and why it's relevant for cards, but like the one thing that is the same across every category, everything we do, it's the concept of like true market price. Like that's what this thing is worth. And that's what we mean when we say that it's a stock market in the same way, like if you buy a share of Nike stock on the New York Stock Exchange, you know, you don't go home and your friend's like, ah, I got that cheaper on Amazon. Like, no, like there's one market price for Nike stock. And if you buy it, you feel confident that, yeah, like, you know, you're getting it at market price. And like, that's why this company has been successful, but take out the, like the stock X, like, like business part of it. Like, I just want to be able to track, like, what's the value of like Lucas Silvers right now and watch it in real time, as opposed to having to keep going to eBay and, and looking at its sold, sold results. Yeah. And eBay just recently started suppressing the best offer. Uh, accepted prices so there's always been this sort of like internal battle within collecting of what's the value of the price what's the comp and it's there's never been like a true one place to go to get the value so i can definitely see the value there so why don't you just jump in a little bit more into StockX as it relates to cars and kind of give us an overview of uh you know what you guys have going on now what what kind of led to this point and uh yeah yeah well so like i said um you know uh the backstory, you know, uh, was certainly very personal. Um, and I think more than anything that explains why I'm decided to be the one to lead the category here. But, you know, we'd always been looking at it. The things that make a really good, um, product, a really good category in StockX, is, um, is you have something that that's standardized, 
you know, for sneakers, we only sell brand new sneakers and we show a, a stock photo of the shoe, right? You don't see a picture of the actual shoe you're going to get. And that's okay because all the shoes are brand new. And so um, cards already had a built-in standardization, right? Grading. So you buy a, a Luca PSA 10, right? A PSA 10 is a PSA 10, like you're good. And you can, re and you can rely on that. Same thing. And so we actually don't support BGS yet, but uh, literally any day uh, it'll be up there. And so we'll have both PSA and BGS. And um, so, but because there was a built-in grading system, uh, it makes it a product that is potential to work. Then you look at, you know, how do people determine what this thing is worth in the market? Um, and, you know, again, the similarities between sneakers in 2015 before we launched and cards right now are like identical. Everybody's going to eBay to check sales results. No one knows what a true price is. Everybody is, you know, trying to figure out who's going to scam them, what's real, what are the issues. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. And that fragmentation just creates a really, like, tough market, you know. Um, as I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you have people like every day that are asking you how to either get into cards or what to buy or all that. And it's hard to tell someone, you know, here's what you should go buy. Because even if I tell you, you're going to have to go and know how to navigate through eBay and understand that the buy it now prices there are going to be for the most part, extremely overpriced. And it's meant to negotiate and how to deal with that on eBay and all that, right? That's just, it's hard. And, and, and it, it artificially keeps people out of the industry and out of doing this. And this is what we did for sneakers. I mean, StockX today is bigger than what we thought the entire sneaker market was in 2015 because what we found was the model just made it easier for people to come in and buy it. So there were so many people that wanted like a cool pair of Jordans, but like they didn't want to wait through eBay to try to figure out what was real and how much to pay for it and all that. And so we just made it easy that you can buy a pair of Jordans as easy as you can buy a pair of shoes at, at Foot Locker or something like that. And so, you know, as, as another point, I'm sure that you and your listeners are very well aware of with all these new people coming into the hobby, right? You just want to make it easy for them. You don't like any, any friction in, in making a buying and selling decision. Uh, it just limits the, the growth. And so for all those reasons, um, it really was exciting to be able to do that. And, and, you know, like I, I went into the national at that point with like, a, I was like a nine out of 10 excitement level. And like, I'm a 90 out of 10 at this point. Like it is like, I just, you know, and so we still have to get the word out. We still have to, to execute it. But like, yeah, it is, it is super exciting. Um, not to be a downer, but what sort of like criticisms have you heard so far? Like what chatter and noise and, and how have you guys sort of addressed some of the things that, that you've been met with from collectors? Yeah, no, in fact, it's not um, a downer. Like I would, um, I would love this opportunity to actually sit and talk to all the critics as opposed to trying to, to resolve it in a, in a tweet or, or a message board chat or whatever, like nothing ever gets resolved there. And so therefore we don't really even engage. Um, you know, StockX is um, uh, for sneakers and for uh, other categories, we authenticate the products. Um, for cards, um, obviously we don't have to authenticate it. PSA or BGS has already authenticated it. Um, but we have to be able to stand behind that label. And, um, and the immediate reaction is uh, from some people, particularly high-end collectors, particularly vintage collectors, is that, well, you know, a, a, uh, you know, a, a Jordan 9 is not a Jordan 9. You know, they, there's, and that's true. I totally get it, right? And for some class of collectors, um, they, they're going to need to see the actual Jordan 9 they're going to get. I totally get that. Um, but for the overall majority, our view is that they don't. And by the way, right, they absolutely don't for a Luca Prism 10, right? Or for a, a, a whatever, a De'Aaron Fox-like Prism 10, right? Um, and so that is going to be, I think, the really interesting part. We've heard it from the day we decided to go into this at every level, which is, you know, how much we stand behind the slab versus create uh, a process to be able to see the card. And the short, the short version is like, we're never going to show a picture of the actual card. And if that means that that's a card that doesn't work on StockX, then okay, that's a card that doesn't work on StockX, right? Like I'm going to guess nobody's buying a 52 tops mantle. You know, if you can't see exactly what that thing looks like, no problem. Totally get it. That's just a card that just doesn't fit our, our market. Um, it's also why we'll probably never do raw, right? Raw, you have to see it, right? Then you don't have any of, of the, the support of the, the grading case. 
And so our job is really to make sure that the case is legit. It hasn't been, it's not a fake case. It hasn't been tampered with. Um, and it is what it is. And then after that, it's on us to be able to build that catalog on cards that, that make sense. And what it means is if you look at our catalog today, it is heavy on new, really light on vintage and doesn't go into any of those super premium, you know, cards like, you know, like what's, what's on the front of, of every probe scene email of, you know, of, you know, here's a, a mantle and a maze and a, you know, and an Aaron rookie and all that. Like, yeah, like that's going to be it. And like, so I, I think that's going to be our challenge as we grow the catalog to um, just to be able to manage that. And then similarly, as we go into say uh, wax, if we do that, you're going to have similar same issues around what do you see? How do you authenticate it, et cetera. Um, and, and then into other cards like Pokemon and magic, et cetera, and how that is. And so I feel like that's kind of like the seminal issue that everybody hits on and they're right a thousand percent. And, um, and the answer is just, is like, that just may not be the, the card for us and that's okay. Yeah. I, I really appreciate hearing that from you. Cause I, I think that's, that's basically what I've been telling people. I've, I've heard a lot of people come to my channel and say, Hey, you know, card X isn't on stock X. Like I can't find this rare piece or, well, not every card is going to be a fit for StockX and it just doesn't make sense. There's not enough liquidity. You can't have a set price if there's not enough sales. So there's a lot of reasons for for what you guys are doing and, and I appreciate you sharing that uh, here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so what's the vision going forward? What's, what's like the next big thing? I, I understand you have some sort of announcement for us today. Where are you guys at uh, going forward? Yeah, well, so, um, you know, StockX as a business really grows in two ways. Um, we continue to add new categories like we're doing now with, with cards. Um, but then we actually start to work with brands and have them release products directly into the market to literally IPO products into existence, right? So today we're, we're a secondary market. We're an evolution of eBay, right? We're a better resale market. But the, the growth, the real business is you work with brands to go into the primary market and have them release products directly. And we've done a few of these. Uh, we actually did one with Adidas um, that ended uh, two weeks ago. And, um, and Adidas released three shoes. It was exclusive to StockX. It was only available on StockX. And, um, and the products, and this is what it means to sort of IPO a product as opposed to a traditional release, um, it goes into the market not at an arbitrary retail price. We didn't, you know, the shoes we, could have been a whatever, a 175-hour shoe. There's no retail price. You let the market decide the price. You literally run a, a what's called a Dutch auction and you let the market decide the price. And, and this is a way that a lot of securities are priced and a lot of stocks are priced as they go into an actual IPO. And a lot of that, frankly, is a really fascinating, interesting finance stuff, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is the consumer just bids what they want to pay. Say, listen, I'm willing to pay $200 for the shoe and that's it. And then what we do is you basically, you take the top bidders and, um, and you end up with a, a market price that is uh, usually less than what uh, people bid. And, um, and it's a really fascinating process. And we've done all sorts of like uh, blog posts and, and really deep dives to understand the mechanics of it. But the, the core is like the consumer set the price. We don't set the price. The manufacturers don't set the price. And so the Adidas one uh, two weeks ago was amazing. Uh, and then literally uh, like an hour ago, um, we launched one with tops. And I think I actually... Well, I was gonna. I, I plan this right and have all this stuff here. So, oh, we had um. So this is a new product from Tops. It's called uh, Bowman Chrome X. Um, it is a uh, hundred um, Bowman Chrome, a hundred people from the Bowman Chrome set, all prospects and rookies, um, top hundred, all numbered to thirty-one, and all uh, pre-slab by PSA. They're all tens and nines. Most of them are tens because they all came right off the line, and um, and so there's um. Uh, and, and it's all being sold on StockX right now as a, as a live IPO. Uh, there's two ways you can buy it. You can either buy it as a one card box or a five box case. And, um, uh, and that's it. And then so uh, it, it opened an hour ago for the next three days. Anyone can go to the site and bid, bid whatever they want, whatever they think that, you know, it's willing to pay. It has, you know, Vlad, Tatis Jr., Alonzo, um, you know, all those guys. The checklist is on the, on the site too. Um, but they're all numbered to 31, not available anywhere else. Um, and from the IPO model and the card industry, super exciting. Um, but honestly, the, the to me, well, I think the, the thing that is just the, the best here is that Tops understood this before, like, I didn't have to pitch them. 
Like the guys at Tops like got this even before I started to, to, to pitch them on this IPO model because I think they've been doing a good job of sort of thinking ahead of like how do they use technology in order to release products, right? Obviously, they've tried things that didn't work as well like eTops, but, you know, they're doing their futures packs and other stuff. Like they're constantly thinking about how to use technology. And they saw StockX and they saw the IPOs we've done before and they're like, that's how we want to release product. And I was like, that's how we want you to release products. Like this is like, you know, it was perfect. So you could, you know, this is obviously it's limited. There's hundred players, number to 31. So there's 3,100 cards. Um, it's 400 boxes of five and 400 cases of five and then uh, 1,100 singles. So it's only 1,500 products, but you could foresee a scenario where, I don't know, the next like, you know, Prism Basketball, Prism Hobby Basketball gets released as an IPO as opposed to just these arbitrary high prices that Panini puts and then the distributors mark up. And, uh, and you could just let the market set the price for them initially as opposed to, you know, what goes on now. I mean, you saw what happened when the first Zion cards came out, the contenders and crashed Panini's website, right? Like that's an antiquated model to have arbitrary retail prices and the, the, the way to distribute it is everybody go to this website and try to win and like crash this. Like that's just antiquated stuff in terms of how products are released. If you let the market decide, then you can have just an orderly event. And so, so for these, for the Bowman Chrome X, everybody has the same fair chance to participate. There's no, you have to know somebody, you don't have to, to be, have a bot, you don't have to, to win and get there first. It's just like whatever you want to bid. And if that bid is, uh, you know, is, is uh, um, in the money, um, if you're one of the top bidders, then you'll win it. And if not, then it wasn't worth that much to you. And then you're happy anyway, because that's all you're willing to pay. Because all the bids are blind, so you can't see what other people bid. So, anyway, that's a lot, but it's uh, it's just super exciting, and and I can't thank Tops enough for for just like like seeing the vision and having the same vision as us to do this, and and that's pretty cool. Uh, one of the reasons I've never gotten into shoes is I've always been intimidated by the sort of like bot run way of buying shoes. So that's kind of interesting way, and also. I've, you've kind of made me think like, is there a world in which these companies actually release the singles directly through an IPO, you know, instead of like the sort of gambling aspect of, of wax? Is there any way that's like, I know I want a Luca, but I don't want to, you know, have to wait for re I don't want to have to wait for the secondhand market, et cetera. So is there any uh, room for that kind of model? You know, it's interesting. We, you know, we hadn't really thought about it like that. I guess you could. Um, if you did that though, you would, I think the inevitable outcome of that is you end up in a world where they don't even make all the other cards. Right. Like, yeah. right. I, I mean, we all know that, you know, whatever, whatever cards are worth. And so there is still, I think, you know, part of the fun of like having a set and, and, uh, and I guess particularly for kids and maybe people that aren't as investor focused as we are. Um, but it works really well. The IPO model would work, would still work totally fine to do that. Um, obviously the price would be, would be very high. Um, but it just works as long as you can just standardize the thing, right? If you were releasing, I don't know how many Luca rookies they made, whatever, let's say, I don't know, 10,000, right? It, it, it would work phenomenally because you have 10,000 of the same asset. And that's really all you need in order to, to do an IPO is you need to have, you know, some liquidity, some amount of the same asset. And for this, there's two different products. There's one box case. There's 1,100 of those. There's a five box uh, case and there's um, 400 of those. And so that's good. So you have 400 of the same asset, 1100 of the same asset, and you can run the IPO model. Have you guys engaged Panini on this idea? Um, we have had uh, very good conversations with, uh, with Panini and Upper Deck. Um, I wish I had something to announce right now. We have nothing else to announce today. We're, today is all about the product, the project with Tops. Uh, but hopefully at some point soon, uh, we can see something from Panini and or Upper Deck. Yeah, there's definitely some frustration with the first off the line model. Just like what you said, there's uh, even I know exactly what to do and I'm getting and I'm not getting boxes and I have the money. It's like I have the money. I'm willing to pay you that price. Why can't I get this, this cards? Right. It's, yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. frustrating. Yeah. Look, the retail pricing for any product like this, any product like sneakers or cards, anything that is supply and demand constrained. It's just an antiquated model. It just it just is. And because we've had retail price for all of history, um, it's a hard thing to let go of. It, by the way, imagine how hard it is when I walk into like Nike and Adidas and say, hey, we should get rid of retail pricing, right? I mean, it's okay. It's a, it's a long game, um, but, like, but it is so logical. 
And we didn't make any of this up, right? All we did is just copy the stock market and how the stock market works. So for us, like, you know, we're following a pretty like sound model here. And so it's just about like how you apply that to the consumer world. And so we'll see, like, I don't think it happens overnight. Um, but you know, it, it was great. The tops understood, you know, from day one that, that this would be a, a, an interesting and, and more logical way to release product. I think it's really smart on your guys part to engage with the brands. Cause if you, if you push away the brands and you're competing with them, right. And you're trying to like build the secondhand market around them. Whereas if you engage with them, you can do things like you're doing with IPO and, and get more oh. collectors more excited and get everyone on the same page. A thousand percent, right? The best example of this is uh, the ticketing industry. So in ticketing, um, you know, the leagues and the teams used to like try to arrest ticket scalpers and were and shutting down ticketing websites. Well, like about 10 years ago, StubHub became the official resale marketplace of Major League Baseball, right? Basically the leagues and the, and the said, why are we fighting the ticket industry? We should work with them. And then, then they started doing primary deals. And so StubHub has the primary deals for the Sixers and the Yankees and a few other teams, right? So like once you start to work together, like just everybody benefits from that. There's just no reason because you're not going to kill the secondary market for any of this. Like it exists. It's not going anywhere. So you might as well figure out how to work together. And honestly, the people that win at the end of that are the customers because they don't have to deal with like, you know, it used to be you'd have to like, you know, meet some guy in a sketchy parking lot to get some tickets to go inside. And now like you can just buy them online like anything else and it's just better. Yeah. And uh, I'm assuming Panini would really benefit from your guys' tech infrastructure. Uh, I work at Amazon, so I have a pretty good understanding of how all that stuff works. So then being able to lean on you guys for, hey, help us release this product and let us lean on your tech and not have to worry about all these, you know, uh, IT issues, like that's got to be a huge gain for them as well. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you, um, how, how much you understand that, right? Because like we're a technology company, right? We have over 200 developers, right? At, at StockX, like we're a tech company. And, um, and as much as people like got mad at Panini for their sites crashing, like that's not their business, right? They make cards and, and they make really cool cards, but like, you know, that like, yeah, they shouldn't have to worry about that sort of stuff. And that's exactly right. Yep. So it's a great partnership. Um, I want to hear a cool story and I'm going to kind of narrow in on the fact that uh, you guys have part ownership with Dan Gilbert. Is that correct? The owner of the Cavs? Yep. Any, any cool story about the Cavs? Maybe a little LeBron tidbit for, for me and my fans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So, so Dan is, um, Dan's actually a co-founder of the business. The short version of a long story is that Dan and I had the exact same idea to create a stock market for sneakers. And I didn't know Dan, I'd never been to Cleveland, I'd never been to Detroit, which is where Dan's based. And, um, and we were somehow able to find each other and, and do this business together to create StockX together. And obviously Dan doesn't uh, work at the company day to day. Dan has a lot of other things that he does, um, but is true co-founder in every sense of the word. And when we started, there were five of us and we just sat literally like right outside of Dan's office. We might've been you know, Quicken Loans employees for, for all it matters. And, um, and so we sort of, you know, became very sort of integrated within that, uh, his ecosystem and, and the other people in the cabs and everything else. So, you know, I don't know if I have any really extraordinary stories, except for the fact that, you know, up until last year, um, you know, I was at, got, I got to go to every single finals game for the past couple of years, including game seven of the 2016 finals. Uh, I was in the locker room, you know, when they won with champagne and, and rings. And I, I literally have... I literally have like my, my Cavs ring like sitting on the desk right here, uh, like right next to me. Um, so there were a lot of really like fun uh, perks and uh, and just to be around that that ecosystem. Um, but maybe the coolest thing that we did with with the Cavs and and through the relationship with Dan is we actually did the first IPO that we ever did was with Nike and it was uh, it was a function of the Cavs. What happened was the Cavs won the the championship in summer of '16. And that fall, the Cavs marketing team came to us and said, hey, listen, we're, we're doing this project where we're going to take the Cavs court, the court that they played on last year, and we're going to cut it up and turn it into memorabilia. And we're going to sell and make different stuff and sell it. And they said, would you, StockX, would you like to be a part of this? And I was like, absolutely, I would like to be a part of this, like for sure. And they said, all right, well, you know, come up with an idea. What do you want to do and let us know? And so we came back and said, listen, I want to create sneaker boxes. I want to create a, a shoe box made out of wood from the court. And they're like, okay, no problem. We figured out how much wood they needed and we were going to build them. And I said, all right, well, now we got to put something in them to sell. And so we were going to like make a custom sneaker. But instead, so we called up Nike and said, hey, listen, we're doing this box with the calves. 
do you want to be a part of it? And they said, actually, we're about to re-release LeBron James' first retro sneaker. So this was LeBron's first shoe that he ever wore in his first game, and they were bringing it back. It was the first time that it ever came back, so it was like a really big deal. And I said, what if we release it in the box? And we put it, and I was like, this is unbelievable. So we did that, and then at the very last minute, I said, Dan, I said, I said, and I was kind of joking. I was like, what if we put rings in the box too? And he was like, oh, we can do that. I was like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, you can do that. I was like, okay, bet. We're doing that too. So we have this box that has the shoe and the Cavs ring in it. And it was the first IPO we ever did. It was January of 17. And, uh, and it was all for marketing. Uh, there were 46 of them. They sold for an average of like $7,000 a piece. It was crazy. It was a front page of the homepage of the New York Times. Like it was just, it was a massive thing. Um, and a lot of it was just, you know, we, we did this and it was fun and Nike got on board, but it was because of the relationship with Dan and the Cavs that like, they were like, Hey, do you want to be a part of this? And it's very much actually emblematic of how Dan's entire organization runs. Um, there's actually about 130 companies total. Uh, Quicken Loans is sort of the flagship. Uh, Cavs are probably the most notable and it ba- and they're all private and they're all Dan, but it all sort of operates as sort of one family of companies underneath. And, uh, and it was great to be able to do that. Obviously, it's super cool to go to finals games and sit on the floor and that sort of stuff. But, uh, but doing that one it was pretty special. And it led to the idea of all of this. Like, this probably never happens, or at least it happens in a different format, if, um, if that didn't happen in, in the way that it evolved. Yeah, it kind of got your feet wet with like the whole process and meeting the, pe- the right people and the right brand. So, that, I mean, that definitely counts as, a, as an awesome story. So, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap up, um, what I really appreciate about you and, and Gary and some of the guys is you guys are, are very approachable on social media and just in the public in general. So what would you say to collectors who are feeling a little bit uneasy about this uh, as it relates to, you know, uh, communicating with you and having platforms like this where we can discuss these types of things? Yeah, you know, it, it's um, I, I appreciate that you um, pointing that out because, um, you know, StockX has more than a thousand people now and we have six authentication centers. We have offices in three different countries and, uh, and it's a big company. And, um, but the, like the one thing that I like every single day, like I, I kind of stress about is like still feeling like a small startup, a small, like transparent, you know, companies, even as much as like, you know, what gets written on the, the website and everything like that. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time literally just like, we launched cards. I, I was, it was like retail politics. I, I, I'm still doing this, going door to door to literally meet every single person in the industry. Um, and, uh, and, and basically like selling them stock X like one by one, because like that's, you, you can't be to be a multi vertical, like global marketplace in 2019. You can't be eBay. You can't be this like one size fit all. We're going to do this. You have to be a collection of local marketplaces and niche marketplaces, right? Like if we didn't do anything else and we just did cards, like you would expect that we know every single person in the industry and we know every single thing about it. And you're like a true expert in every part of that. And like that, you just have to be like that. And so um, it's great that, you know, in watches, we have people who are like that, that understand that part of the business. I don't know watches, right? Same thing in, in handbags. But, you know, for cards, like that's me, right? And, and I'll be there and I'll be at the National and I'll be in Toronto at the show and, and all that. And by the way, because I also love it. Um, so you can't like fake that, right? You can, I can't like send a, a marketing rep or whatever to, to be in and like run the booth or whatever. Like, no, it's got to be like me and, and, you know, the couple other guys here that are also like, you know, diehard, you know, card collectors. So, yeah, it's awesome. I, I love the opportunity. And by the way, the best feedback you get is that, is when, you know, the, there's there's two types of completely unfiltered feedback. There's like the Twitter and Reddit and blowout, which is just sort of like the vitriol of like keyboard like warriors. But like what someone will tell you like to their to your face is both uh, like is usually like pretty like honest and usually like insightful because if they care enough to walk up and say that, like a lot of times they have pretty like interesting things to say. So, well, I really appreciate that, and I, I again appreciate you spending the time with me on this channel, and I'm excited to uh, you know release the announcement of the the new IPO for sports cards, and we'll. Uh, We'll kick that off soon and I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.